everyone. This is Austin. This is Greg. From Life, Love, and Pursuit of Pi. Today we have guest Cheryl Kindred. Hey, Cheryl, how are you? I'm well, thanks. How are you guys? Good. Doing pretty well for a Monday. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so, Cheryl, um, on this episode, we're talking about sleep. Mm-hmm. And how about you tell us a little bit about what you do? Yeah, so my career is... Um, as a sleep specialist for infants and children. Um, and I help people to start their children's lives off right with really, really good solid sleep habits. Um, and so that's what I do professionally. I also do newborn care and have been a doula for many years. Um, so I have 15 years of experience in this field and in sleep and in the needs of people in that kind of just had a baby period of time. Um, And so in that, I've really learned a lot about how dysfunctional many adults sleep is, because the first thing anybody ever wants to say if they don't have a small child when they hear what I do is, how can you teach me how to sleep better? (laughs) So I've learned how to translate what I do for children and babies to adults a lot of times, too. How easy is it for you to translate sleep um, from a baby to an adult? Well, the things that we all need for good sleep are remarkably similar. So there is a lot that can be translated. As adults, of course, our lives get so much more complicated. And even with older children, lives are just more complicated than they are when you're a baby. Um, So there is like a more emotional um, and mental piece to it as well. But the foundation of it is remarkably similar. Um, So I think there's, there's a lot that does translate there. How did you get started into this field? What was your, like, your why of why you wanted to, to do this? So I went to a therapist who, um, many, many years ago now, who specialized in um, kind of career transitions and in career coaching. So a big part of her practice was career coaching. And I really was very directionless. I didn't know, know what I wanted to do. I was, like, 19, and I wanted to... I knew some of the things that I wanted in a profession, in a job, but I didn't know what that profession was called or what it was. Um, And she said, you know, at the end of a couple of sessions, she said that it sounded a lot like I was talking about doula support, which is support of the pregnancy, birth, postpartum experience um, for people going through that. And I started doing it. I went to a training and I was like, this, nobody is going to take me seriously. I'm a 19 year old who doesn't have children, thank goodness, um, and who's going to like tell people how to have a better experience having children. Nobody's going to take me seriously. Um, but I really wanted to go to the training and learn how to do it anyways, because it's really compelling and um, really amazing to me. And I wanted to do something that involved support and education and making people's lives better. And it had a lot of change to it. And that did. And so as I got into it, I realized that for uh, people did take me seriously, amazingly enough. Thank goodness. Um, and people did take me seriously. And I learned that the birth is just this one piece of it. And the postpartum period and the adjusting to having a baby, and being a parent is a huge thing. It takes up a lot more time than the birth. Even if it's a really long birth, it's still longer that you're going to be raising a baby and a child. And I got to see what support in that period looked like. And the biggest thing that people needed support with in that period was sleep. It's the thing that people tell you when you're going to have a baby. They say, oh, you're never going to sleep again. Well, that doesn't add up, though, because babies are supposed to sleep the majority of the day. So if they're supposed to sleep the majority of a 24-hour period of time. Where's the disconnect there? Why... Why isn't that happening and why are, why is everybody losing sleep? Um, and so I just was, I just kind of transitioned very naturally into doing more postpartum support and then really focusing on sleep because nothing makes a bigger difference in life, um, in like the quality of life and in somebody's physical, emotional, and mental health than sleep does. Nice. So you mentioned the disconnect for babies and like parents getting sleep. Um, so what is the key to getting 
like your child to sleep when they're supposed to? So sleep needs building blocks. You need like a solid foundation to have good sleep. So some of those are, you know, what else is happening in the day? You need to have periods of activity to have periods of rest. You need to be, uh, for a baby, a baby is going to, a baby is really unique. They're going to double to triple their body weight in a year. So if you imagine doing that yourself, you would have to eat so much constantly, right? So if you want your baby to sleep really well and they have to eat a lot, they have to be eating that in a certain period of time in the daytime. So at first, in the first few months, they're going to eat around the clock because they're going to almost double their weight in three to four months. Um, if you want that to happen, um, for them to start sleeping more, uh, after that three to four month period of time, they need to be taking in all of their caloric needs for a day in the daytime. So that's a big piece of it. Um, and then foundations like sleep hygiene, which basically is a fancy you know, way of saying the environment in which we sleep and the things we're doing before we're ready to sleep, routines and structure, and then also building off of the body's natural process our hormones um, and our metabolism and our digestive system, all of our body systems are meant to support good sleep. So if you build on that, then you create the good sleep foundations. Obviously, with the exception of, you know, a medical need or a problem or something like that, but in a stable, secure environment, a baby of just a few months old can sleep a 10 to 12 hour stretch at night um, and will be a happier, healthier baby because of it. And of course, then the parents and everybody else in their life is so much happier and healthier. Okay. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, Is there any food that adults should eat throughout their day to help promote uh, like a good sleep pattern? So foods that give our body long-term energy are going to be better to eat in the evening if the goal is sleep, because your metabolism does slow. There's so much into adult nutrition, um, and I'm definitely not a specialist in it completely. I know enough to get by myself. Um, but you know, if we want our bodies to sleep well, we have to be giving them everything that they need in the course of our waking time. So having you know balanced meals throughout the day is a good idea. But, you know, if you're eating a really, really light dinner or some people, and this is particularly true for women who often have a pressure to look away or fit away or whatever, will often um, think, oh, well, I'm going to skip dinner because I ate a lot earlier or I snacked a lot or whatever. Um, You know, your body is then going to say, hey, it's not time to sleep. It's time to forage. Our, our bodies don't know that we live in the modern world. Our bodies are, you know, the way we're built, our biology is kind of said, hey, if you don't have what you need, the drive is going to be to go find it now. That's why I have that midnight snack, right? <laughs> does it help you sleep or does it keep you up? Uh, depends on what I eat. <laughs> right. So eating, overeating taking your digestive system into like overdrive and telling your body, Hey, work on digestion this right now. Um, that's probably going to keep most people awake. So is sugar and caffeine, of course, but you know, having a lighter snack is probably, or having a moderate snack is probably going to do more for helping your body feel satisfied. And like our job is done here. We're, we're good to rest now. So, is it a good or a bad thing if someone takes naps throughout the day? Would that help or hurt their sleep cycle at night? So for an adult, um, I think, and for a baby too, we all have individual needs. There are some basic truths that are true for most people, but there are a lot of ways to get the amount of sleep that you need. Everybody's body is a little bit different. And so I really like tracking how much sleep you're getting and tracking how you're feeling about an hour or an hour and a half after you wake up. It's normal for people to wake up and feel groggy. Um, The science supports that that's normal. 
there's a lot of people who do wake up feeling very energetic, but the majority of people wake up and we feel a little sluggish. We're slow to get started. You know, it makes sense because our bodies slow down overnight. So when we wake up, they wouldn't, of course, kick into overdrive right away. So I would say the most important thing is to figure out what an individual's sleep needs are. I do it for babies and children, um, and I think adults need to do it for themselves or need to work with somebody who will help them figure that out. So figuring out how you feel about an hour to an hour and a half after you wake up, as well as how you're feeling at different points throughout the day is really helpful. It's normal for everybody to have like an energetic peak. You wake up and you're kind of down here and you are kind of low in energy and you have this peak of energy around that hour to an hour and a half after you wake up. You have a lot of energy. That's a good chunk of time to do all the things you need to do. As you start getting into an energetic kind of dip, for most people, it's three to four hours after they get into that high energy peak. So if you wake up, it's, let's say, 7.30, you get that energetic peak at 9, around 12.31, you're probably going to have a little dip eating something that gives you energy, and then maybe doing something physical with your body, as simple as going for a walk, rehydrating, moving around, is going to help you to have less of a dip. But there is a natural dip in there. So if you're time blocking, that's a good time to do more mundane tasks that are simple, don't take a lot of energy. Um, you know, if you're at home on the weekend, this is a good time to like get your laundry done because it doesn't take a lot of brain power or energy. You're just kind of doing something routine. Um, and then you're going yeah. to get another peak of energy. For a lot of people, they'll get um, two more of those throughout the day. So making sure that your meals are kind of in those intervals will also help with that energetic peak. Um, and then the important factor for a lot of adults is that when you get that last energetic peak, and you start getting sleepy after that, that is your body's natural time to go to sleep. If you fight through it and you ride past it, you will eventually get another dip, of, another um, like scoop of energy, if you will. So you'll get into that place and you'll have a harder time falling asleep because you've kind of worked yourself into being overtired and your body is like, oh, well, we don't know what's wrong, but something's wrong. So let's give, let's put some more energy out. Oh man, I can definitely relate to that. <laughs> I remember like being tired or like you're in bed on your phone. Mm -hmm. and you know you're tired, but you're like reading something or watching TikTok. And then all of a sudden you're like wide awake again and you're like, fuck. <laughs> right. And you can miss that window. I think what, people take it two ways when they miss that window. They're either like really frustrated with themselves, defeatist. You know, it's going to make it harder, of course, if you're like beating up on yourself. I should have gone to sleep already. Now I'm never going to be able to sleep. You can talk yourself into never being able to go to sleep if you do that. Or you can kind of recognize, oh, hmm, I kind of missed my optimal window. It'll probably take me longer to settle down to be able to rest and then accommodate it by expecting it to take a longer time to fall asleep and being really okay with it. Um, the, the biggest difference, I think, for adult and child or infant sleep is that we have to wrap our brains around it and they just have to do it. You know, they just have somebody else facilitate it for them and then they just have to kind of accept that it's time to sleep. For adults, we don't have somebody doing it for us and, you know, nurturing us, making sure we have everything we need. We're responsible for doing that for ourselves. Um, so if you are not good at that, you know, it's something to like start developing some skills in because you'll function so much better when you have, you know, when you're well rested. Is there optimal temperature or um, position, I would say, that, that helps facilitate that sleep better? So as far as temperature, um, part of it is habit and what we're used to. Part of it is that there are optimal temperatures where we do sleep deeper at generally a temperature that's fairly cool, but not cold. Um, so for most people, something around 68 to 72 is really ideal. 
for children and for babies, especially, that is the de facto ideal temperature. For adults, um, it still is really the ideal kind of range. If you're not sure what temperature it should be, that's a good way to have it to have it in there. And I think like from a, it's interesting because well, you know, before the show we were talking a little bit about gas prices, and I think like people do worry about the cost of fuel, the cost of electricity or whatever. Um, and a lot of people will say, oh, well, I will make it, I, I'm not going to turn my heat on if I can help it. If you're uncomfortable and you're not able to sleep, you're messing with your productivity. Like maybe it's worth a little bit, you know, of an investment there and like a more comfortable temperature, or you could compensate with other things like, um, you know, a heavier duvet or a quilt or, you know, thermal pajamas or something like that. Same thing for in summer, having cooling, you know, at a bedroom is really does help a lot of people sleep overall is just having those kind of good temperatures. So for me, I try to cool and heat the room that I sleep in more than like my entire house, all of the other hours or all of the overnight hours. Now, is there a, I guess, ideal, so like ideal sleeping environment, like should it be dark, completely quiet, or can it be like a little noise? Or is it more of this like, uh, so conditioning it, thing. Right. So part of it is conditioning. Part of it is also what is optimal. So we do have, we do have this biology that tells us the world is maybe not as safe as many of us are fortunate to have, you know, really safe day-to-day -day existences. Um, the world kind of what our body thinks is that the world is absolutely not safe. A saber tooth tiger might be attacking you at any minute. Um, and so if we're hearing really startling noises, it is common to get startled out of that and for like your flight or fight reflex to kick in, for your hormones to start racing, for your heart rate to pick up, your digestion to pick up or slow down and for your body to be ready to do something. So having a lot of noise or um, falling asleep while watching something really loud or that has a lot of intermittent loud so like a action movie where there's periods of calm interspersed with like loud fight scenes or something like that is definitely going to create a lot of sleep disruptions some people however will sleep through a lot they're heavier sleepers um is usually how they'll refer to themselves or what other people will say about them um that part is partially conditioning and partially is just innate to somebody is just what they are. So somebody who is maybe neurodivergent or who has like some history of PTSD or some mental health things that they're working through or a traumatic background, those type of people are generally going to be, regardless of conditioning, more sensitive sleepers as far as noise and impacts and lighting. Um, so I definitely do think for all of us, however, whether that whether that's you or not, having a darker environment, um, a cool, not cold, but cool environment, um, and having little to no light, um, and avoiding avoiding a lot of blue light or a lot of really stimulating light before we're as we're gearing up to go to bed, that's all going to create a better foundation for sleep. That doesn't mean you're going to be able to just simply and easily fall asleep, especially if you have struggles with that, but it gives you kind of the best tools. It's like cooking with a sharp knife or a good pot. Now, from a lot of people working from home, does looking at a computer screen all day affect your sleep? So it, does and it doesn't. It really depends. What you do in the hour and a half to two hours before you go to bed is going to have the bigger impact. So if you get off of the computer a couple hours before you go to bed, um, that's going to be definitely better for you. It's probably also better for from a you know work life balance perspective. It's not always possible. So some things that you can do are using like blue light glasses or getting a filter or a screen protector that is um, 
blue light that, you know, that cancels out some of that blue light, those harmful, like really active light. Um, and what our body, what our body thinks about light is light is day, you know, light is meant to be stimulating. So our bodies, our, our brains know the difference. You know, this sunlight, this is daytime, this is nighttime, whatever. Our body, our biology doesn't know the difference. So, um, so having, you know, like a blue light protector or something like that, or blue light blocking glasses and things like that, I would say are a better plan than just telling people not to do it. So, you know, it's not realistic to say, hey, don't ever use the computer before you go to bed. I, I know nobody's going to listen to that. Yeah, that, that, that makes sense. Um, now, about people's sleeping positions, what can you really learn about the way people sleep? So sleeping positions are are definitely much more personal thing and less of a quality of sleep thing, except for people who have any sort of sleep apnea or breathing position, thing like that. Um, the optimal position for most people to sleep in from a, you know, body integrity point of view is sleeping on your back um, with a pillow that allows your neck to like relax back. You should, you shouldn't be like, you know, with your pillow, like pushed forward because your pillow is so big and fluffy. And you also shouldn't be kind of hyper extending so that you're looking up at the sky. Um, so having kind of a neutral type of resting position is better. For most people, they sleep better on a bed that's kind of reasonably firm, soft, but not too soft. So like something like a like a pillow top um, or a like cushion on top of a firmer mattress is going to be good because then it's going to balance the body structure um, and our spine and our bones are meant to sleep on a firmer surface. They thrive under a firmer surface. However, we don't perceive a firmer surface as as good of a resting place, as good of a resting position for our bodies overnight. And so kind of balancing that out will probably be the best thing for people. I'm a side sleeper. I'm not a back sleeper. I've never been. Um, Post-surgery, I had to sleep on my back for a few weeks. And I don't think without having like the painkillers that is taken from the surgery, I don't think I would have been able to sleep. Um, so what you can do is then make sure that you're in generally as neutral position as possible so that your spine is generally like you have decent posture as you're sleeping and so that you have, um, for a lot of people, a pillow between their knees really helps and then having the same where your head is kind of in a pretty upright position. So your pillow here has to accommodate your head being in a fairly neutral position, not like super like this, not super like this, not leaning back or forward. So as neutral position, it's kind of balancing both our, our human need for comfort, for like a creature comfort, and our body's need for more stability, especially because ideally you're spending, you know, seven to nine, or more hours kind of in that sleep environment. Um, so it's a big chunk of time. So with that, if, if you don't get the seven to nine hours of sleep, uh, what type of negative side effects can come with that? So sleep deprivation is a form of torture. You know, it's really, really harmful and really damaging. It impacts so much. It is to be significantly sleep deprived makes you a less safe driver than to be full on drunk. Like drunk driving is, and we all know how absolutely harmful that is. It slows your reflexes. It um, makes you less cautious, you know, erratic, slow to respond. Um, sleep deprivation does a lot of those same things. And we've conditioned ourselves or so many people have conditioned themselves to be so used to it and so accustomed to it. So it's as if we're, we're teaching ourselves to function on half empty. We're teaching ourselves to function suboptimally. Um, so the other things that are gonna happen are it impacts metabolism, energy levels, 
digestion, other body health systems. Um, it impacts our immune system. It impacts our cognition, our memory. Um, and there are, there's some, there's even some research that says that it impacts um, our lifespan. So it impacts I would say almost every aspect. Emotionally, there's a huge impact too. People who are sleep deprived have um, more struggles with impatience. Um, you know, they're often more snappy. They're more sensitive. Sleep deprivation is linked to more impulsive choices in foods, um, more impulsive choices in addictions, uh, so many things. So basically, the more you condition your body to live under especially chronic sleep deprivation, even just a little bit of that chronically really does have a major negative impact. And so whenever I say that to people, they're often like, oh, I feel not hopeless. It's really not. Um, we can improve that by doing just a few things. I think the biggest one that I think people need to focus on is yes, knowing all this stuff is super important, but prioritizing and making time for sleep and for rest is the only way that it's ever going to improve or change for somebody. So that is, you know, if I had to give somebody like one, if you can do one thing to improve your sleep, it would just be, if you want it to be a priority, if you want to feel awesome and energetic and you want to kind of be functioning at, you know, 80, 90, 100 percent. Well, you've got to, you've got to do that. Okay, that makes sense. So, so when you say prioritize sleep, like for example, be like, I'm gonna start winding down at 8 p.m. and then I want to be asleep by nine. Yeah, you can set something like that. Um, it really depends. <laughs> if I would, I would recommend people do that if that works for them. But for adults we're all so individual and what we need and what we want and what we're available for um, is so, so individual. So for some people saying, I want to be asleep by this time is going to create more pressure. For some people, it's going to create less. So for me, I'm really, I do really well with having a schedule that I know that I can keep. Um, so for me, having a, I'm going to be in bed at this time. I'm going to disconnect at this time. I'm going to, um, you know, do a couple things that kind of gear my body up for sleep by this time is really helpful. If you are an all or nothing person, usually that's not going to work for you. So I made done is a better, is better than perfect person. So perfection is not what I'm striving for, nor is it what I'm recommending to pretty much anybody because it's just not sustainable. Um, if you are a person who it's all or nothing, doing something, setting yourself up for that is usually going to result in the nothing more than the all. So somebody who, you know, really has that kind of outlook or has that kind of um, framework if you say, I'm going to be asleep by nine, if at 9.05 they're not asleep, they're probably going to perceive that as a failure. And they're going to be so much more inclined to check out of what their actual priority was, which was sleep. Um, I think the for most people, the best way to look at it is I'm just going to set myself up for success and then I'm going to let what happens happen having that kind of laissez-faire attitude. Um, I've also heard it called the beginner's mind, which is a Buddhist concept. And it basically means I'm going to just show up and accept what happens. So we give the proper framework. You know, you have a good bedtime routine, you have good structure, you're kind of going with your energy levels, going with that kind of third dip is a good time to be winding down, be shutting down. If you're doing all those things, chances are you're going to sleep and your sleep habits, whether they're okay or amazing or um, terrible, are going to, they're not going to get worse. They're going to improve. So for all those people who have, you know, a dicey relationship with sleep, let's say, it's going to get better, especially if you take the pressure off of it. Um, if you tell somebody 
you know, you have to sleep eight hours a day to function optimally. It's the only way to function. Well, if they are never able to do that, it feels like you're setting yourself up for failure, I think, because you are. So then I would just say the most, the more sleep you can get, the better. Um, and then, you know, if you are somebody who really doesn't have that many overnight hours to be able to sleep or a shift worker or, I don't know, have a demanding schedule or travel a lot or something, figuring out where else you can make up some of those hours is really going to help in kind of the goal of functioning as fast as we can. Nice. Do you have like any explanation for, you know, what it feels like some people can fall asleep in like 10 seconds and others take like an hour as soon as they close their eyes? So it's just, we're all different. We're all different. Mm -hmm. And not one is not better than perfect. You know, like one is not better than the other. Like, if you can fall asleep really easily, most people will say you're really fortunate, whatever. I mean, it does make some things easier to be that way, um, but it's not the norm. I would say most people are probably somewhere in the middle. It takes them more time to wind down. Um, and so just knowing and accommodating that I think is the better focus. So um, I have a evening journal exercise that I do um, from this journal that my therapist recommended to me and was like, this is a really cool tool. Um, I had done something like that already, but having it on a one page, like I get to recap my day, write down anything that I might need to remember tomorrow. For me, that allows me to take less time to kind of shut down and be ready to sleep. Um, for other people, um, having a, a ton of structure in that routine where it just feels like step after step after step, all in the same order, very kind of meticulously is going to set them up for, you know, falling asleep more quickly. Um, but I would say rather than trying to change that about ourselves, accepting it about ourselves is probably the better avenue. Do you, do you have any good resources for people who might want to learn more about sleep, like any books that you can recommend or websites, news articles? So there is so, so much information about sleep out there. Um, I really like sleep articles from medical journals. Those tend to be my favorite sources. Um, you know, so I would say that is what I would recommend. Just go to medical articles. Um, so you can use your public library for that. You can use, you know, um, a lot of sources on the web. And that'll be your most accurate source of information. Places that tend to diffuse a lot of medical journals and things like that and make accessible information are awesome. I also find that we're really, really high tech these days. And there are a couple of apps that I really like for tracking sleep or for improving sleep and creating better habits. Um, and that can also help. But I think for many people, if we focus so much on, on having to understand it all rather than do it, we're, we're probably missing a lot of the point. So as far as like, you know, here, read this 400 page book about sleep. It's not usually my recommendation unless somebody is absolutely super passionate about learning about that. It's probably not the best use of your time. Maybe you should sleep during that 12 hours of published content. Okay. But. So you, you, you've been doing this since you were 19. Mm -hmm. That, I mean, super successful if you're still doing it since you've been 19. Um, have you seen a positive impact in your sleep since you first started? So, yeah, absolutely. And I think the bigger positive impact that I've seen is just that I've always known that it's something I have to focus on. And I've always been gentle on myself about needing to get the sleep, up, the amount of sleep I need. I need upwards of eight hours of sleep to off function optimally. Um, and if I'm at all sick or traveling or having a hard time with something stressed or something, I need well over nine hours of sleep. Um, and it's not something that is bad or wrong or whatever. A lot of people think it's almost like a badge of honor to need very little sleep. Like, oh, I function great on six hours of sleep. 
Okay, if you do, you're in single digit for sense of humans. Um, I, I usually, not that I think somebody's lying about themselves, but I think they're probably lying to themselves if they say that. Um, I think being the biggest positive focus for me has been that I've always understood that the amount of sleep we need is not a values-based judgment. It's not any reflection on ourselves or anything. It's just simply what we need. Um, and so making sure that I'm able to get that and being pretty unapologetic about having that need um, has kind of been, always been my way because I know that's just, it's literally how all humans are. So I'm not saying I need something special or different. I'm just saying this is my need. All humans have this need in their own way. And I've, I've you know, if I am not able to get the amount of sleep that I need overnight, then I know to either modify my expectations of myself, my amount of productivity on five or six hours of sleep is going to be probably just shy of half my amount of productivity on nine hours of sleep. So, and if you do the math like that, it's better for me to get those sleep because I'm gonna be able to do more than double the amount of things. I'm gonna more than earn back those three and a half, four more hours that I might have sleep slept, um, or four more hours that I might have slept because I'm going to have five more productive hours in the day. Um, and so if I'm not able to get that at night, then I will try to take a nap, usually during one of those energy dips. For me, I tend to nap best when I nap during my first energy dip of the day. Everybody is going to be different. I find that doesn't impact my ability to fall asleep at night, um, and I usually am able to get a really solid nap then. Um, and I know that I need to either do one or both of those things. So either modify my expectations or accommodate getting the rest of the sleep that I need. Okay, so from from all of your time uh, of being a sleep specialist, if, if unless you have a better, uh, what what would you prefer to be called for your job title? Um, so I am a sleep trainer. I'm, a, I'm an infant sleep trainer. Um, and so I usually call myself a baby sleep specialist or a ch child sleep specialist. Okay. Um, what type of certifications, exams have you had to go through? If, if any, I mm -hmm. don't know a lot about the, the field. So just out of curiosity, how would one get started if they wanted to pursue this path? So there are a lot of different trainings. If somebody wanted to focus on child sleep professionally, on infant sleep, um, especially, then there are a lot of different trainings. The training that um, I went through was many years ago and is an organization that's since disbanded or dissolved or whatever. Um, but I did a training and it was I, uh, around three days of full-time in-person content with a pretty big component of self-study um, and um, like work that had to be submitted. So basically do these projects work with these, you know, kind of scenarios and then submit these kind of reviews. Um, it is not a field that's, that certification is required to be upheld or anything like that. There's, it's not a licensed profession. Um, and I think for me, the biggest things that I would focus on for somebody like wanting to get into that field are that it does take a lot of passion and dedication. Um, and I think focusing that on both learning about what sleep is like and should be like, as well as kind of working through it, learning how it needs to be and how it needs to function um, by experience is really helpful. Um, I do a lot of continuing, continuing education within my field and also just personally. So I'm the person who does read those giant sleep books um, and try to stay really up to date on it. I find it fascinating to learn about, and I think there are so many norms, and I don't think there's any one wrong or right way to do it. I basically just think that within a block of time, within a day's block of time, we need to have a certain amount of it be focused on sleep, and it's very individual what, what that is. Do you, I'm assuming you do, because you've been in this business for so long, you have a lot of successful client stories. Or, or like people who come back to you? I do. I've done sleep training for multiple people in the same family, extended family. It's always really fun to be able to get to come back 
and sleep train their subsequent children or their niece or nephew. Um, you know, probably I'm probably about 15 years away, hopefully, from sleep training some of my my sleep training graduates' children. Um, but that will be really fun when that happens someday. I look forward to that. <laughs> Do you plan on staying in this business for a while? Yeah, I love it. I think I'm, I think I've had a lot of um, success in it, both personally, but also for the impact that it provides other people. Um, some of my favorite things that people say after doing sleep training for their children or their babies um, are our whole family is happier. My baby is more fun to be around. They're so happy all the time. They're healthier. They're not getting sick. They're eating better. So much functions better when we're sleeping optimally. And a lot of times parents will also say, I sleep better after sleep training. Hearing you talk about child sleep and baby sleep and their needs, you know, it made me prioritize my own sleep or it made me, um, you know, dedicate more importance to my own sleep and things like that. Um, additionally, you know, if your child doesn't sleep, you as a parent aren't going to sleep. So the you know, positive impact there. It's really satisfying. And I think we can ask for very little other than from our career, um, other than to be both, um, you know, supporting ourselves well and being really satisfied and feeling fulfilled. So I feel, you know, super lucky that I'm able to do that, but also um, proud that I've worked hard to be able to do that. Yeah, it's been a a long time, you know, that's definitely like, I I heard a quote once and I think it's, it might be true, I, please correct me if not, you know, we sleep a majority, like one third of our life. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if that's true. Mm -hmm. um, so within that, I forgot to ask this earlier, um, what really are REM sleep cycles and what, what happens during REM sleep? So our body goes through various stages of sleep. Um, and it's really interesting because this is the place in which baby and adult sleep is the most dissimilar. We all have the need for it, um, but basically our body is meeting multiple needs when we're sleeping. And so our body needs to be creative, to process our emotions and to, you know, really have that, um, that kind of, it's very cathartic and it's really rejuvenating. So basically our mind doesn't turn off when we're sleeping. And when we go into that really REM state of sleep, that's what we're doing is we're processing. Our, our brain is working really hard because our brain doesn't have to be working on all the things we're working on when we're awake. It can focus all that energy on processing, on um, you know absorbing information, on retaining it. And so within that period of time, of course, yes, you're dreaming, you're in creativity, whatever. Some people remember their dreams, some people don't. Um, it's not a reflection on if you get that um, stage of sleep, if you're getting that rapid eye movement sleep, whether you're remembering your dreams or not. Um, but what your body's doing in that is that your brain is able to really process what it needs to process. Um, and so that is why they will say, you know, studying is enough. You have to study and sleep and study again. It's because we retain information because we're processing it. So if you think of your your brain as a computer, as a, you know, as a really, really fragile, really needy, demanding computer that requires a lot of different charging methods, then giving your brain that sleep, it's allowing it to actually do that kind of computing process. Like that is what's happening in that. In our lighter stages of sleep, um, those in-between stages are really just our body shutting down and allowing that all to happen. And so it's all important. Um, I don't spend as much time or focus either with children or with adults on are we getting enough sleep, enough sleep in these, in this stage or in this stage. I, I really feel that the bigger focus should be on how are we feeling later as a result of this amount of sleep. So if your sleep, uh, so people will ask like, how is, how do I know my sleep is high enough quality? Well, 
how do you feel? You know, do that same thing that I talked about earlier. Chart how you feel an hour, an hour and a half after you wake up. And then chart how you feel after those energy dips. You can get really in depth with it. You can chart how long those energy dips are and how long those energy peaks are, times where you feel optimally focused and suboptimally focused or really exhausted. Um, because how much sleep and if you're getting the most optimal amounts, um, if you're getting the right amount in each different sleep stage, it's less relevant than how you feel and how you're functioning. So the practical application, I think, is where I I would rather recommend people focus their time on, and where I'd rather what where I would rather focus my time on too, both for myself and for others. Because if the result isn't that you're feeling great, you're feeling like you're functioning well, you're feeling like you are able to remember most things, that you're able to have the energy to like follow through with a task, um, that you have the energy to that you have the brain power and energy to retain what you need to retain and do what you need to do. That's the biggest focus. Okay. For anyone who might want to, you know, reach out to you, utilize your services, what would be the best way to contact you? Do you have a website? So as a sleep specialist, I primarily work as a contractor, which means I work through a couple of different businesses. Mm -hmm. um, I do take private clients often by referral. Um, and so my personal contact information is usually what I share. Um, and so I can give you guys my email address, like link with this if you want. Um, because for me, for me, from a work-life balance perspective, working as a contractor and allowing other businesses to kind of do the management system um, and me just to do the actual, you know, client facing work, the work that helps people benefit um, is kind of my focus. So I can be found like on LinkedIn or on Facebook or anything like that. Um, and my profiles all like say that I do work with sleep and I work with infants. Uh, but no, this has been great. I definitely learned a lot, especially about sleep and different uh, ways to improve your like sleep. Um, building blocks for your environment. So, very helpful. I plan to use some of these tonight. <laughs> oh, good. Well, I hope you have a restful <laughs> night. Well, we appreciate it. And this has been another episode of Life, Love, and the Pursuit of Five with Austin. And Greg Gaskin. And Cheryl, thank you for coming on. We hope Thanks you have a good rest of your night, me. guys. Thanks for having All me. Right.